Attention au chien. Be very careful. Can we come in? Yes, do. You expected this or not? Yeah, I, I did. I expected it tomorrow at the same time. Okay. You once said, I live like an Englishman, I think like a Frenchman, and I write like a Russian. I never said that, of course. No. Of this course is typical. Not. This is typical of the age we live in. This sort of thing is attributed by some press agent. And then uh, I get it back at me all the rest of my life, except some people said, you once wrote that you live like a Swede, you eat like a Norwegian, <laughs> and, and it's, it's all untrue. Yes. You've been one of the privileged people who met Gorbachev in person. This, this must have been a remarkable visit. How was he, it? Yes, because he's a, an extremely... Uh, intelligent. I mean, it's very few people that you can say immediately that they're intelligent. And he's intelligent uh, in many ways. For instance, during his last big speech in the Kremlin, uh, which was to an audience of 900 to 1,000 foreigners, uh, he suddenly stopped in the middle of what he was having to say, which was not abrasive at all. It was not calculated to annoy any other country. It was very... He suddenly stopped and said, I have a terrible feeling that I'm talking too quickly for the translators. And then he looked at the translators for a confirmation. And one translator got up and Gorbachev said, I'm terribly sorry, it's my fault, it's my failing that I, my ideas run away with me and I start talking too quickly. I'll watch it from now on. And the rest of the speech he gave at half the pace, frequently looking in their direction to see whether he hadn't forgotten himself again. Now, if there's nothing else, this is intelligent. Because it's also very flattering for the translators, and it's flattering for everybody else who has a party in it, because it shows I'm helpless without you people. You're important, even though it seems to you that you're not important because you're just following my text. You are tremendously important. Uh, in that sense, he, is, he has a degree of almost humility, uh, which I find very acceptable. Samen met een aantal intellectuele vrienden als Arthur Miller en James Baldwin... buigt Justinov zich regelmatig over de vraag hoe het verder moet met onze wereld. Na hun laatste meeting stuurden ze zowel Reagan als Gorbachev een verslag. Het Witte Huis antwoordde, uw bericht in goede orde ontvangen. Het Kremlin zei, kunt u overmorgen direct bij meneer Gorbachev komen. Hij wil hierover met u praten. Dat eerste onderhoud, gepland voor drie kwartier, zou uiteindelijk ruim drie uur duren. There again, sorry to interrupt you. I didn't say anything. No, but I, you were making a gesture. <laughs> um, there again, what I found extraordinarily interesting was that uh, he said to start with uh, that he had read what we had uh, written. Uh, would we now please explain it to him further? If he found anything that we said particularly exciting or he reacted strongly against it, he reserved the right to interrupt. But he said, if I have the same effect to you, on you, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. And I told him that I never thought that I ha would live long enough to have such a conversation at the pinnacle of Soviet power, or in fact, at the pinnacle of any power. But I must say, you're extremely positive about him. I'm extremely positive. I'm not suggesting that he's a man without faults. They must be there. I met Queen Juliana, who was, uh, who was uh, adorable, because it was the Erasmus Prize, in which I was asked to go there in order to make a speech for Charlie Chaplin. I was asked by him, because he said he was too shy. I should have known better, because I made an eloquent speech, I thought. In Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, on his behalf. And he used me as a warm-up man, because immediately I'd finished, he got up and made a speech uh, about himself, <laughs> which was uh, the other person to share the uh, prize with him was Ingmar Bergman, who couldn't come for some reason, but a lady came from Stockholm uh, to accept the prize for him. And Queen Juliana, who's also short-sighted with these big glasses, looked around, wanted to shake the Swedish lady's hand, but suddenly couldn't find her. And the Swedish lady had gone into a deep curtsy. She was down on the floor, looking upwards. And Queen Juli uh, Juliana suddenly saw him, but oh, got a real shock at seeing her there and said, oh, get up, please. You, we don't do that in Holland. And she said from the floor, we do it in Sweden. <laughs> and Queen Juliana, with a flash of annoyance, said, well, really, when you are in Rome, you must do as I do in the Romans. Please stand up. And then took me aside afterwards, and I'd never met her before, and said, I hope I haven't offended the poor woman. 
You know, it's terrible. Everybody tries to make me seem as though I'm not just a normal person. I hate that, she said. They also accuse me sometimes of being narrow-minded. How can I be narrow-minded that have had practically every meal in my life in a room with eight famous Rubens pictures in it? En dan Indira Gandhi. Toen Justinov in de tuin op haar stond te wachten voor een interview, werd ze vermoord. The thing that was sinister about this assassination is I didn't hear a single voice. Just shots. And the animals in the garden, the squirrels and vultures and things that were there, they knew perfectly well by instinct that it wasn't meant for them. Talking about death, I somewhere read that there was some kind of a similarity in the way your parents died because both of them had a sort of a final phrase for you. Is that fact or fiction? No, well, it's not quite right. There was one similarity there, uh, which is very strange because uh, my father, uh, when he was dying, was in a coma and he spoke to me and to everybody else only in French, which was really very surprising because he'd really never talked to us in French when he was alive. He spoke either English, occasionally in German, but very rarely in French. And uh, he woke, came out of his coma for a moment, looked at me and said uh, in French, Tiens, je te reconnais de mes rêves. That's odd. I recognize you from my dreams. It was very touching. That's the last thing he said. And my mother, who was very pro-Western and, and not at all fond of her youth in Russia, when she was dying, she spoke to me only in Russian. And I don't speak Russian very well, and sometimes I didn't know what she wanted, but I could imagine it. The last thing she said was simply that I put on my little radio right near her ear when she was in a coma, coma and um, uh, played a, a bit from Don Giovanni quite loud. And she smiled and said Mozart. That's the last thing she said, which I think was a very, very good last line for anybody. Fine. Your, your father at several occasions stated that he didn't want to get any older than 70 years. He told me during the war he refused to get older than 70 because he said uh, life's not any fun, one is in a decline, it's not interesting, I don't find it interesting. I promise you I won't live more than 70. And he died about four or five hours before his 70th birthday, uh, over 20 years after he said that. And it was a very Roman death because he really disappeared. But where are the real dogs, Mr. Yusinov? Well, I'm the real dog. These are the false ones. Ah, here we go. Come on. Ivan. Come on, Ivan. Ivan. He needs a lot of coaxing to come out of there. He makes the noise and the other one does the demonstration. Come here. Come here. Come here. None of your party tricks, you're sulking today. It's always like that. Had you come tomorrow, as was foreseen, you would have got the front of the dog instead of the back. <laughs> it's the general attitude which I found uh, frightfully interesting and, and uh, a step ahead of many of us in a way. If they send, um, for instance, if the Russians send a uh, hundred students to America to learn something or other and only 80 come back, the Russian reaction still tends to be, where are the other 20? And the reaction of the Chinese is, 80, come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much more restful. But uh, how do the people in those spots react, for example, on your wife? Because they must have made big eyes or not? Yes, they did. Well, we went certainly to a part of the world in, in Langzhou province, uh, in Gansou province, at the time of Langzhou. Uh, which is the poorest part of China, and which uh, the annual revenue is in parts of sixty dollars, you can imagine. And there, uh, they had never seen a non-Chinese face, and the Chinese were slightly worried about their reaction. So one felt like Marco Polo again. Uh, the reactions were all different. We have them on camera. An old lady with an enormous amount of things on her back. Right? <laughs> <laughs> An old man who's rather military was absolutely outraged by the sight of us. Uh, a small boy, unable to move, and a small dog tied up. 
absolutely wild with fury, longing to get at us. <laughs> and then the thing that suddenly brought us together was the red varnish on my wife's fingers. The, the nail polish. They suddenly and looked at know. that. And they did everything they could. They licked it. They tried to scratch it. They were not worried about the varnish. They knew what that was, because there's lacquer everywhere on the train. But they thought it might be a disease at first, so they were nervous. And then when they got to see what it was, they became terribly friendly. And uh, that was a marvelous meeting. When I see what everything you're doing, the dish must be here for your dogs, because you don't ever have the time to look television. Oh, I looked at these American hearings the other day and found them absolutely riveting to hear indirectly what's going on over there. General Secor, let me ask you now, what did you do? in trying to get the arms from Israel to Iran. Uh, I went to Portugal, sir. Portugal? Is that a logical place to go to get arms? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't, I can't tell you what it was like. Is there any wish in your life that remains to be fulfilled? No, to see a little more of the impossible dream made possible, that's all. I don't think, uh, uh, with the amount of people there are on this earth, all thinking differently, but all dragooned by the media into thinking the same locally, it's very difficult. But I think it's still absolutely possible. I mean, what's really tragic to me, not tragic, but dramatic, is that the means of communication are so wonderful the only thing we haven't yet improved is what we say to each other. And I've been called in the swimming pool by somebody from a swimming pool in California just to prove that they had a telephone in their swimming pool. Well, he didn't tell me anything except to ask what the weather's like. That, I think, is a waste. Since the <laughs> telephone is a bomb for you, it's even Telephone's more negative. Telephone's a bomb for me, absolutely. I mean, things were much safer when we didn't know immediately what was going on in another part of the world. I will never call you again. Don't ever call me again. And don't forget that information work moves very fast. And misinformation moves at the same pace as information. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a real joy. Thank you very much. Thank you well. And touch scenes. Okay, you walk back into your house because we follow you with the camera. Ja, meneer.